Welcome uh, to Jerusalem, everybody. I am myself in Jerusalem uh, for the uh, 56th year of mine. And uh, out of 62, I'm 56 years in Jerusalem. And I know the city. I know the city. But every day I discover that there is more and more to be known about it. And every day of living in Jerusalem is a day of discovery for me. Now, as uh, for burial customs, burial customs in Jerusalem start approximately uh, 5,000 years ago. The earliest tombs that we have go back to uh, the very late 4th millennium uh, B.C. and the very beginning of 3rd millennium B.C., So uh, we have a continuity uh, from uh, the late 4th or early 3rd millennium through the late 3rd millennium, through the 2nd millennium, through the first temple period, up to our own days. Uh, This uh, continuity, I think, is unparalleled anywhere else in the world. Uh, The uh, tombs of first temple period from the time of the Davidic dynasty from uh, the 8th and 7th centuries BC. Uh, They are known in Jerusalem mainly since the 70s of the 20th century. The uh, tombs uh, are arranged in three cemeteries. Uh, One is the Eastern Cemetery in Siloam Village. The other one is the Northern Cemetery north of Damascus Gate, uh, of which uh, the Garden Tomb is only one example. And uh, the third one uh, is along the Valley of Hinnom, which embraces the historical city uh, on the western side as well as on the southern one. The the burial caves uh, of uh, First Temple period of uh, what we call the Iron Age, the time of the Davidic dynasty, uh, they number about 140. And... uh, Uh, Some of the characteristics of them are already visible in this picture, which uh, shows myself in a younger age than today. Uh, The the picture shows you uh, three uh, Greek P, or Hebrew Het, shaped benches, burial benches, upon which uh, the uh, deceased were stretched together with uh, the burial gifts. Uh, This uh, arrangement of three benches and a floor which is lower than the entrance. You see the entrance over here, and uh, the floor is here. You can see remnants of the ceiling which was quarried away in a later period. This is one of the tombs at Ketef Hinnom uh, on the uh, edges on a high shoulder above the valley of Hinnom. Next one, please. Now, uh, the uh, dark picture that uh, we have seen before marks the burial cave of uh, the royal steward uh, in the uh, 22nd chapter of the book of Isaiah. We have uh, the prophet uh, going to a high-ranking official of the kingdom of Judah and saying to him, who are you and uh, what do you have here that you made yourself a habitation in the rock, cut yourself a tomb in the height uh, of Jerusalem. This uh, inscription was found in the facade of that tomb and it mentions the title, the very same title, uh, Asher al Habait, he who is over the royal household, uh, the one which is mentioned in Isaiah. And uh, this is the first uh, Hebrew inscription, uh, rock cut inscription, which was ever found. It was discovered in the 1870s by a Frenchman, Charles Clermont Ganneau, and moved uh, to the British Museum, where it is on display until this very day. In any case, the inscription, which has three lines, uh, is uh, of uh, very good Hebrew uh, characters and Hebrew language of the 8th century BC, fitting to the time of Prophet Isaiah. And it is very much possible that this is the very tomb which uh, the prophet meant in his prophecy about that royal steward or the uh, official who, he who is over the royal household. Yes, please. Now, in First Temple period, they stretched the bodies on top of uh, burial benches, and this is a uh, picture taken in one of the tombs in the northern side of uh, Jerusalem, in the northern cemetery, north of Damascus Gate. 
uh, you have here the benches, and uh, these are, uh, this is the central passage in between the benches. This is a burial cave which is today uh, located underneath a girls, uh, an Arabic girls uh, school uh, just opposite Damascus Gate. Uh, it was discovered probably in the 60s and was uh, uh, hidden by the nuns who discovered it from the Jordanian authorities. Uh, and they were afraid that the school might be, uh, the construction of the school might be jeopardized uh, by this discovery, and therefore they uh, hid it from uh, the uh, Jordanian authorities. I discovered it, uh, rediscovered it, and published it in uh, 1994. In any case, uh, underneath the benches, there is an entrance to a, a hollowed area, which is the repository. Uh, when the flash decayed upon the benches, they collected the burial, uh, burial remains, that is the skeletal uh, remains of the deceased together with the burial gifts and uh, deposited them into the repository underneath the benches in order to make room for the next generation upon the benches. Yes, please. Uh, here we can see a repository uh, such a repository underneath the right-hand side of a bench in a burial cave which is in the backyard of the French School of Archaeology, the Ecole Biblique, again in the northern cemetery north of Damascus Gate. The bones may not be of First Temple period, but the cave is. In any case, uh, the bones that you see inside the repository, uh, they mark uh, the burial custom of First Temple period. Uh, in First Temple period, people were gathered to their fathers. That is the expression we have so frequently in the Old Testament. The uh, term gathered to their fathers uh, means that they were brought in to meet their forefathers. And uh, he who looked into the repository really could see that he is but a link in the chain of generations. And there is no significance to the individual but uh, only as part as a uh, family. This is uh, the repository. Now, they believed also that the deceased continue to live, and they live in a sphere which is down underneath. That is the biblical Sheol, or Sheol. Uh, that is uh, uh, the sphere in which the dead continue to live, and therefore the witch of Endor, when she brought up uh, the... Uh, uh, spirit or the figure of Samuel, she brought him up, up from down below, because that is the world of the deceased. In the uh, Second Temple period, we do not have a continuous life of the deceased, and we do not have uh, the Sheol or that sphere in which the deceased continue to live. In any case, uh, the, uh, as the deceased continue to live, there is no resurrection in the Old Testament. Uh, there is no uh, belief in resurrection. There is one exception, of course, the story of Ezekiel's uh, prophecy of the dry bones. But in, uh, in principle, they did not believe in uh, resurrection because they believed that the deceased uh, continued to live. They continue to live in a different sphere. And if they continue to live, they have to be equipped with... Uh, all household objects and household equipment and food, uh, as well as jewelry and weapons, all what is needed by a living person is needed also by the deceased, and therefore we have lots of burial gifts accompanying the deceased in First Temple period, something which is entirely different in Second Temple period. Yes, please? Over here, we see one of the monuments of First Temple period. It is an above-ground monument uh, which is enfreed from the rock on, on uh, five sides, and it is attached to bedrock only at the base. Uh, it has a beautiful cornice adoring uh, the uh, upper part of the monument. It, has, it had also an inscription on the facade. This is the so-called uh, Pharaoh's daughter's tomb in Siloam village. Uh, such monuments are very rare. We have uh, five of them only, and only in the capital, Jerusalem. Yes, please? Over here we have a uh, rest, uh, headrest uh, for the deceased in the shape of the uh, hairdo or the wig 
of the Egyptian goddess Hathor. Uh, this type of headrests, uh, of which we have about a hundred in Jerusalem, this type of uh, uh, headrests is typical to First Temple period. It is probably an imitation of a portable piece of furniture which was put into the beds of people in that time and they supported the hairdo in order not to uh, mess it up during sleep. They uh, supported it uh, with uh, such a uh, cushion-like uh, device that they put into their beds. Yes, please. Now, uh, this is uh, an example of a... Oh, this is much better. Uh, this is an example of a uh, burial cave uh, in the Western Cemetery next to uh, 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 Scot Scots uh, Scottish Church of St. Andrews at uh, the shoulder of Hinnom, and it shows you the headrests uh, and the arrangement how this uh, uh, P-shaped uh, chamber had uh, the deceased arranged. Uh, this is the entrance to the repository, this is the uh, threshold leading into the chamber, this is the floor, and this is the repository again, and above the repository there is a bench upon which there is room for six, uh, uh, six different bodies uh, to be stretched. In the, on the back bench over here there is uh, one person on the uh, left-hand side bench for the, he who enters, there was room for two. You can see the headrest of this one. This guy uh, very simply refused to lie on this bench and share it with another one. But actually, uh, there is here a neck opening of another uh, burial, uh, uh, of another headrest. Uh, and uh, uh, they were stretched here uh, on this bench, two, uh, two bodies. Uh, that is to say, uh, they, uh, each of them smelled the feet of the other. Uh, <laughs> next one, please. Now, uh, this is uh, a replica of the uh, previous uh, tomb. You can see the si row of six headrests over here, and you can see the back bench over here and the left-hand side bench. This pottery, uh, which is put into uh, the... Uh, a replica of the tomb which was prepared by the Israel Museum. Uh, the pottery was found inside the repository. The repository included more than 1,000 different objects, pieces of, uh, uh, of uh, silver, arrowheads, uh, jewelry, uh, pottery, uh, and uh, other objects. Uh, about 360 intact pottery vessels were found inside the burial cave. Yes, please. Now, inside the burial caves of second temple period uh, of the first century BC and first century AD, we have different, totally different arrangements than in uh, first temple period, than in the uh, Davidic dynasty's time. This is a, another burial cave in the lower Hinnom Valley, uh, which dates back to the second temple period, to first century BC. You have false doors here. You have a, a decorative cornice, uh, faceted cornice at the meeting point of the walls and ceiling. Uh, you have a uh, rosette-shaped flower uh, decorating the dome-shaped uh, ceiling of the cave. And most important of all, you have burial niches cut perpendicularly into the walls in order to put the uh, uh, deceased into. These uh, burial niches, which are known as loculi or kuchim in the Aramaic, kuch or kokim, sometimes K-O-K-H-I-M, kokim. Uh, this uh, kind of arrangement is typical to Second Temple period only. It does not appear during First Temple period, and in this period, the uh, the attitude towards the deceased is entirely different, and the architecture representing the burial customs, uh, the uh, architecture reflecting the burial customs is entirely different than what we had in First Temple period. Yes, please. Here are, uh, this is a burial cave in, uh, to the north of Jerusalem. This is uh, a well-known cave, the tomb of the kings. You have the steps leading down into the cave, and you have those kokim 
or burial niches which are entirely missing in first temple period. In second temple period, the burial benches, the high elevated benches, which were for uh, the stretching of the bodies of the deceased, they are entirely missing. So we have those uh, niches. The niches, or the kokim, make their first appearance in the Hellenistic period. It was suggested that it is under the influence of Alexandria of Egypt. They make their first appearance in Palestine in Maresha, uh, which was the capital of Idumea, about 45 minutes uh, southwest of Jerusalem. Uh, the niches were for the preliminary burial only. Uh, they uh, had the deceased inside, and then uh, the place was blocked by a slab of stone. Uh, sometimes on the slab of stone, uh, the name of the deceased was uh, uh, incised or painted over, and uh, we have uh, sometimes the niches being closed by masonry and plastered. And on the plaster we have uh, the uh, uh, details of the deceased who lies inside. Uh, after a year, approximately, the flesh decayed. They came back and collected the bones into a receptacle, a bone box known as ossuary. Uh, the uh, Hebrew name uh, for that uh, usually used today is gluskema, which comes from the glossokomeon in Greek. And uh, in the uh, Jewish sources, it is known by the Aramaic name cheila or chalta. Next one, please. Over here, we see a burial cave in the uh, lower Kidron Valley. And it has another characteristic of Second Temple period, the arch cut into the wall, or the arcosolium. Underneath the arcosolium, there was a shelf, and on that shelf they could put uh, an, uh, uh, a collection of ashuris, they could put a coffin, they had sometimes stone coffins. And please notice the walls which are uh, imitating the paneling of walls, uh, in uh, homes of uh, the uh, well-to-do higher classes of Jerusalem. In any case, you should always remember that all what we have of uh, the burial cave, all burial caves of every period, represents only the upper classes of society because people who didn't have the land, didn't have the ability to own the land, people who didn't have the ability to guard uh, the uh, burial caves, and to hew them out of the rock, uh, those people were buried in simple cyst graves cut into the uh, rock or cut into the ground, and sometimes their tombs were plowed a short time after, and were used, uh, the place was used for reburial. So all what we have uh, from first temple period as well as second temple period is about uh, one to five percent of the population which existed in Jerusalem in these, uh, these days and the tombs, uh, they represent only a very small percentage of the entire population which existed in Jerusalem. From second temple period, first century BC and first century AD, we have over 1,200 burial caves uh, forming a kind of a thick belt around the historical city of Jerusalem. We have uh, from this uh, uh, belt of burial caves, we have very monumental burial caves, and we have very simple ones. All of them are family graves. Uh, that is a common denominator for the first temple and second temple periods uh, both. Yes, please. This is uh, one of the most monumental uh, burial monuments of uh, Jerusalem. This is the uh, so-called Absalom Spiller. Uh, it has nothing to do with Absalom, uh, exactly as uh, Pharaoh's daughter's tomb it doesn't mark uh, the tomb of Pharaoh's daughter. It is just a name, and this is common in Jerusalem because the later generations wanted always to identify uh, monuments that they see around them with... Uh, uh, monuments mentioned in the scriptures. In the book of Samuel, there is a mentioning of Absalom's pillar, but this uh, monument is 1st century B.C., while Absalom lived in the 10th uh, century B.C. So there is a uh, difference of a millennium 
between Absalom and this monument, which today is named Absalom's Pillar. The monument is partially cut out of the living rock, and I showed you already uh, Pharaoh's daughter's tomb, which is a first temple period, which is also cut out of the living rock, and uh, it has a, an independent monument and uh, um, freed from the rock. Uh, the upper part of this monument is built and it has a concave pyramid. This is another phenomenon of Second Temple period, which we do not have in First Temple period. That is the monument above the grave, which symbolizes all the non-visible components of uh, the deceased uh, uh, personality. That is the intellect, the memories, uh, the emotions, and all the non-visible parts of uh, the deceased. Uh, this is a Greek phenomenon, and the nephesh is a translation of the Greek psuche. Psuche is a burial monument which is built either over the, uh, the grave or near the grave, and sometimes even far away from the grave in order to commemorate the non-visible uh, components of the personality, personality of the deceased. So this is a tomb. Inside the monument, there is a burial chamber, which has a flower uh, decorating the ceiling, and uh, it has the arcosolia, the arches cut into the walls, and on top of the monument, there is a pyramid-shaped uh, arrangement, uh, which is uh, the nephesh or psuche. Yes, please. Over here is the tomb of the kings. At the entrance, uh, we have a staircase which leads into uh, the cave uh, from a uh, well-decorated porch, and uh, the entrance is blocked by a round-shaped rolling stone. Now, this is a non-singing rolling stone. Uh, the, uh, the rolling stones, and again, I mean the non-singing ones, the rolling stones... Uh, are very rare in this shape. In uh, more than uh, 1,200 burial caves in Jerusalem, we have only four in which we have a round type of stone, and it appears only in uh, the very highest uh, circles. Now, the name for the rolling stone in Hebrew is golal, golal. And it comes from uh, the term uh, galol, uh, which means to roll. Actually, they rolled a boulder to the mouth of a burial cave in antiquity to avoid uh, the wild beasts uh, from trying to, uh, to taste the flesh of the deceased uh, and to avoid the looters uh, from getting into the burial cave and put their hand upon the burial goods which accompanied the deceased. In any case, uh, every stone which blocked an entrance to a burial cave it was named after those initial boulders. Every such stone was named a golal, even if it was rectangular. And that is the case in most burial caves where the entrance is sealed by a um, kind of a plug, uh, with the size of which and the shape of which is fitting the uh, shape of the entrance, which is usually squarish. In any case, uh, when uh, the stone was found unrolled as written uh, in the Gospels, that means that the cave was open. It does not mean that there was a round stone there. And in most of the books where you have this round rolling stone, you have to uh, remember that uh, there are only four uh, out of more than 1,200 burial caves which would have uh, this uh, arrangement. In any case, when one tries to understand the burial of Christ as uh, it is described in the Gospels, uh, one has to remember uh, the number of burial caves in Jerusalem from that time, and one has to take nothing more than a day and uh, observe about uh, 10 or 20 of those burial caves, and you get an idea of uh, the tooling used by, uh, by people in order to uh, uh, dress the uh, rock and in order to do the finish of the uh, 
uh, of the hewing of the burial caves, you have a uh, good idea of the uh, burial customs reflected in the architecture of the burial caves. But if you go only to uh, the garden tomb, uh, then of course you are not going to have an idea about burial customs of uh, first century BC, first century AD. So this is a good example showing you the rolling stone, which is a misconcept in most of the books dealing with the burial of Christ. Yes, please. Now, uh, this is another burial cave, uh, which is uh, next to the uh, King David Hotel. Uh, it was discovered in 1890, and it, is, it was believed by the excavator, uh, the late German scholar Konrad Schick. Uh, it was believed to be uh, the tomb of uh, King Herod's family. I myself doubt that uh, identification very much, but it is a very interesting cave. It is uh, cut into a uh, very bad quality of bedrock, very hard and uh, uh, um, a, a bedrock which uh, is full with uh, all kinds of cavities and holes and therefore they had uh, the need to cover the walls with masonry uh, rather than leaving the rock hewn walls uh, uh, bare. Uh, inside the burial cave, there are uh, coffins. You can see the coffins. Some of these coffins are now in the uh, Museum of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate in the old city of Jerusalem. In any case, the uh, fact that we have uh, masonry inside the burial cave and the fact that we have uh, sarcophagi uh, for uh, coffins, stone coffins for the deceased, these are, again, characteristics which are not found in first temple period and are characteristic only to second temple period. Yes, please. Uh, I told you about the ashuris. The ashuris, uh, these are the stone boxes uh, which uh, uh, are um, known in uh, large numbers. Uh, Dr. Rahmani uh, published uh, with the help of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities, a catalog of uh, uh, about a thousand such ashuris which are in the State of Israel collections, uh, or the collections of antiquities authority. And here you can see uh, the display of the ashuris in the Israel Museum. In the background, there is a picture showing uh, the tomb of Sanhedria, in the northern part of Jerusalem, which has those burial niches, the uh, kokim, the burial niches, and they are inside the uh, arcosolia. You have the arches inside which there are niches, and there is a row of niches also underneath the arcosolia. Now, uh, when the body was taken out of the uh, kokim, or the uh, burial niches, when uh, the flesh decayed, they had only the bones, and therefore uh, the size of the ashuris is smaller than a human uh, size. Therefore, because uh, it is uh, directed by the uh, size of the longest bone, which is the thigh bone, and it is about a half a meter to 60 centimeters uh, in average length. The uh, uh, boxes had, have lids uh, which are sometimes gabled, sometimes flat, sometimes rounded. Uh, you can see different arrangements, and sometimes they have the lid uh, sliding uh, into its place in uh, uh, kind of uh, ledges uh, made for the lid, uh, and this is imitation of boxes that they had in their homes for different purposes. The ashuris are made of uh, softish kind of limestone, which is very significant to the eastern range of mountains embracing the city of Jerusalem, the range of Mount of Olives, the range of uh, uh, Mount Scopus, uh, present-day Mount Scopus. They have this uh, um, softish, uh, chalky limestone out of which the ashuris are made. The ashuris are part of the stone vessels industry. The stone vessels, of course, are connected to the first miracle of Christ uh, when in the wedding of Cana, uh, Jesus uh, uh, turns the, uh, wine, uh, the water into wine and uh, the water is said to be in six stone jars according to the laws of purity of the Jews. According to Second Temple Period customs in Jerusalem as well as elsewhere, 
uh, Jews uh, prefer to have as many as possible stone vessels in their household because stone does not catch impurity. And uh, these stone objects, yes, next one please, uh, these stone objects, the stone boxes, as you can see one of them here uh, from a close look, uh, these stone uh, boxes, uh, they uh, are part of the industry of uh, stone vessels uh, which uh, was done on a very large scale in Jerusalem uh, in first century of the common era. Up till the year 70, the year of the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus and the Romans, they used uh, these ashuris. Now the ashuris are inscribed. Many of the inscriptions are haphazardly applied to the uh, to the walls of the ashuri, somebody had a sharp instrument, had the time and had the surface, and therefore uh, made some doodlings which are hard, uh, hard to decipher. Uh, the uh, uh, writing is always uh, very, very cursive, and it is not done by professional scribes, it was done by the family members. Uh, the inscriptions on the ashuris are a a whole world, and they uh, give us information about family relations, about beliefs uh, connected with death and afterlife, and uh, they are connected also to uh, professions and places of origin. Uh, we can learn that Jerusalem society was trilingual in that period because some of the Ashura inscriptions are in Hebrew, some of them are in Aramaic, and others are in Greek. Very rarely we have also other languages uh, which are used by people who came to Jerusalem from the wide diaspora which already existed in the first century. That is people who came from Syria, from Asia Minor, and even further away areas. Uh, this ashuri here comes from uh, the burial cave of uh, the family of the high priest Caiaphas, uh, which is located not too far from uh, the place where we are just now seated. seated that is to say about, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 minutes walk from here. Uh, you can see uh, the burial or the place of the burial cave of Caiaphas. This one has uh, upon it some scratched characters, very shallowly scratched, and these are the characters of uh, uh, Caiaphas, son of Joseph, uh, which uh, is most probably a member of the family uh, of the high priest mentioned in the New Testament. Yes, please. Over here, you can see a, a burial niche, uh, which is rounded on top and approximately two meters in depth. It is cut perpendicularly to the walls of uh, the cave, and inside it there are two ashuris, one with a a uh, gabled lid and the other one with a flat lid that another ashuri could have been placed on top of it. Yes, please, next one. Uh, the uh, facades of burial caves in Jerusalem, like this one, which is located in the northern part of town inside a, uh, in, within a, a modern housing uh, project uh, which was built in the uh, late 60s, uh, this uh, uh, decorated facade is characteristic to Second Temple period, to the uh, caves of the wealthy. You have here an imitation of the wooden lintel and wooden uh, door jams, uh, which were in the homes of the living, and you can see here a uh, decorated gable, uh, which is taken from uh, uh, elaborate public buildings and shrines, probably also influenced by the Temple of Jerusalem. And you have here bunches of grapes. Can you see it? Bunches of grapes, which probably are imitations of the golden bunch of grapes which was hanging above the entrance to the Temple of Jerusalem. There are Corinthian capitals here and here, and there are wreath decorations. Above the wreath on both sides, uh, there is a lily flower, which is probably the emblem of the city of Jerusalem. So you have here a decorated facade. We have about a dozen of such decorated facades in the uh, necropolis, the city of the dead of Jerusalem of Second Temple period. Next one, please. Uh, these are some of the ashuris from these uh, burial caves. Some of them are very elaborately carved. Uh, the carving is chip carving. 
which imitates uh, techniques probably uh, developed uh, in wood carving rather than stone carving. The uh, stone was soaked in water in order to soften it, and then they carved it with knives uh, exactly as one would carve in softer uh, wood. Yes, please. This is a, uh, a uh, very uh, well-known ashuri of Second Temple period. Please notice the uh, low pedestals upon which the ashuri is uh, located, and you can see the, uh, the ledges uh, upon which uh, the lid uh, slides, uh, and this, this kind of lid is very typical. The inscription says, Simon Bana Hechala, Simon the Temple Builder, this is uh, somebody who was proud of the fact that he participated in the construction of the temple during Herod's time, and he asked his family to write that fact upon his ashuri. Uh, the same inscription is repeated also on the side of the ashuri, and so we have Simon the temple builder uh, for those uh, who uh, would like to uh, follow the idea, which is... Uh, uh, having more and more support now uh, that there was no temple in Jerusalem ever, uh, here we have a physical evidence for the existence of the temple against the temple deniers. Yes, please. Uh, this is another ashuri, a very well-known ashuri from northern Jerusalem. Just look to the elaborate uh, uh, decoration of it, which is a good example of Jewish art of uh, Second Temple period. This is 1st century AD. Yes, please. Now, uh, this is the northern side of Jerusalem. You see uh, Damascus Gate over here. This is uh, St. Paul's Hospice. Uh, this uh, building here is the nunnery of the White Sisters. Uh, and uh, over here are the gardens of uh, the French Dominicans. This is the Nablus Road uh, bus station, and here there is a narrow road, Conrad Schick Road, which leads into the Garden Tomb. This is the other bus station of uh, Sultan Suleiman Road. Please notice the northern wall of the old city of Jerusalem. The place uh, was viewed, not in this angle, this is an aerial photograph, but the place was viewed from uh, uh, this building here. This is the tallest building uh, in 19th century Jerusalem. This is the home of the American family, first American family who settled down in Jerusalem, the uh, Horatio Spafford family. Uh, the Spaffords came from Chicago. They were the founders of the American colony. And in their house, uh, they lodged all the Westerners who came to Jerusalem. Among them was a man who was already a legend in his lifetime who uh, came to Jerusalem in 1881. This is Charles George Gordon, or Gordon the Chinese, later known also as Gordon of Khartoum. Uh, he uh, observed from uh, the window of this building here, above the uh, uh, city wall, he observed this rocky formation here. Yes, next one, please. And he identified this rocky formation uh, which has two large hollowed eye sockets. He uh, identified it with the Golgotha. And uh, after his uh, heroic death in uh, uh, trying to put down the uh, mutiny of the uh, Mehdi in uh, Sudan, something like the Taliban of today, uh, the Mehdi uh, revolt in Sudan, an Islamic revolt in uh, the 1880s, uh, among his uh, belongings, there was found a, uh, a manuscript of a book named Eden and Golgotha, in which uh, he uh, advocated the view that this hill north of Jerusalem is the Golgotha. Yes, please. Still later, uh, this uh, cave here, the entrance of which is here, yeah? this is the entrance and this is the face of the rock, and here there is a uh, courtyard. This uh, cave was uh, discovered later. Actually, it was discovered earlier because there is a short report about the unearthing of the entrance of the cave in 1867 by Conrad Schick, the, uh, the scholar of Jerusalem in the 19th century. In any case, the place was purchased uh, following the idea of uh, Charles George Gordon 
and since then it is known as the Garden Tomb or Gordon Tomb or the Garden Gordon Tomb or the Gordon Garden Tomb. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, this is uh, advocated by some as uh, the burial of uh, Jesus Christ. In the 1970s, I had surveyed it, and uh, uh, when uh, uh, I went into the place uh, with the kind assistance of then the war wardron uh, of uh, the Garden Tomb, uh, uh, Colonel uh, Ord Doby, a uh, very kind uh, Englishman, uh, a true gentleman, uh, I uh, found out that the cave is hewn approximately three meters from another burial cave, pictures of which I showed you earlier uh, in the Northern Cemetery of Jerusalem, which is dated to the Iron Age. That uh, rang a bell, and I began to study uh, the place. Uh, next one, please. And I began to study the place in depth. This is the facade of the uh, garden tomb. You can see here the entrance. You can see that part of it is built in. That is a later addition. You can see all kinds of niches and cuttings into the rock. And even here a, uh, a place where a, an arch, a built arch, was leaning against the rock. You can see this channel, which is nothing else but a trough uh, for feeding animals in the medieval period. It is not a runway for a uh, rolling stone but a trough for animals. This was uh, the uh, aneri, or the uh, um, uh, donkey's stable of the uh, Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. In any case, uh, the place was reused once and again. Uh, the cave itself, without going into too many details, is of the first temple period. The burial cave, the garden tomb, is connected to an area, geographically, to an area uh, which has uh, about 17 burial caves, all of which are of first temple period, some of them even having pottery of that time. Uh, the cave itself uh, does not have any of the characteristics of second temple period, uh, that is to say the kokim or the burial niches. It doesn't have the tooling of the comb chiseling or the uh, combing on the surface. It doesn't have the arches or the arcosolia. It doesn't have the place for the asheris or anything of that kind. On the other hand, uh, the troughs which are cut into the, uh, into, uh, the cave, uh, the garden tomb, could have been reconstructed, or it is possible to reconstruct them as uh, shelves uh, or burial benches for stretching the deceased, and they were cut into to form kind of troughs uh, only in the secondary use in the early Christian period, in the Byzantine period. In any case, uh, the burial cave of the garden tomb has two chambers, one next to the other. One enters and then one turns to the right. This is characteristic only to first temple period rather than second temple period. We have it in the tomb of the royal steward in Siloam village. We have it in the tomb in the Hinnom Valley. We have it in tombs in Bet Shemesh, in Tsuba, to the west of Jerusalem and elsewhere. Uh, in, uh, in my visit, one of my uh, initial visits to the site of the garden tomb in 1974, uh, I began measuring the tomb and uh, preparing a plan of uh, the burial cave with the kind permission of the wardron of uh, uh, the garden tomb. And uh, then uh, I asked them, uh, where can I find, find the facilities? Uh, I had urgent physical needs. And um, I was uh, going to the place where they showed me the loo and uh, I saw a, a half-open door of a closet there next to the uh, facilities with some pottery in it. Uh, you know, whenever an archaeologist sees pottery, he forgets about his physical needs. <laughs> um, and I began to look at that pottery, and I found inside uh, several Iron Age or First Temple period uh, uh, oil lamps, and some other pieces of a first temple period. 
uh, it is possible that that pottery found, was found when they cleared the area in front of this cave uh, in the uh, 1890s uh, when they purchased the place and first began to advocate the view that this is uh, the tomb of Christ. Yes, please, next one. And these are the three uh, oil lamps uh, which I discovered in that uh, closet there, and they are the property of the Garden Tomb Association. I don't think that such objects were purchased for any purpose in the antique market because there is no display or there is no museum there, and uh, they were kept there only because they were found there. Yes, please, next one. Now, uh, this is the Holy Sepulchre, of course, and uh, this is uh, the place about which we have a tradition uh, which goes back to the 4th century to uh, one of the church fathers, Eusebius, who testifies for the first time that this is the uh, site of uh, crucifixion and burial of Christ. Inside the Holy Sepulchre, there is a burial cave with kokim, with burial niches. Uh, now, uh, the garden tomb thus is a place which fits the 19th century atmosphere. The people came from the west, they entered the, garden, the uh, Holy Sepulchre, the place was a gloomy, dark church, and they were dreaming about a garden which uh, they sang about in, uh, uh, in Easter, and popular songs uh, uh, mention the garden next to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. In any case, uh, they also, the Protestants, came uh, last. That is to say, everything inside the Holy Sepulchre was already taken, either by the Catholics, the Greek Orthodox, the Armenians, the uh, Syrian Orthodox Church, and there was nothing left for the uh, poor Westerners who came uh, from Europe and the United States. So uh, one can understand the wish uh, to identify another place as the tomb of Christ based upon the psychology of the 19th century scholars. Uh, to sum it up, I would say that the garden tomb has nothing to do with burial of Christ. It is a first temple period tomb rather than second temple period tomb. And more than that, I would say it is part of a vast cemetery of uh, uh, more than a dozen burial caves of first temple period in that area. The garden tomb is nevertheless a very nice place for devotional activity and I recommend to you, all of you, to go there and have it as a site of your prayers. It should not uh, matter to Christians anyhow because he has risen. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>